Okay, Phil, be alive. Okay. Be alive. Well, hello everybody and welcome to Virtual Red May. This is our fourth Red May. The other three have been live. Uh, we're about to have a discussion with uh, uh, Professor Lali Khalili, who's the author of uh, Sinews of War and Trade, among uh, other books. She's a professor of political science at Queen Mary University in London. Uh, before we do, while everybody is still filing in, as uh, Bhaskar Sunkara likes to say at uh, Jacobin Stay at Home. Uh, let me uh, uh, review the program for the next week and suggest a few other things, discussions you might want to listen in on. Uh, on Tuesday at, uh, uh, what time is it? I think it's 6 p.m. Pacific time. We have uh, the uh, 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 Birth Strike with uh, Jenny Brown uh, and uh, Catherine Armitage will be, be interviewing Jenny. It's about the hidden assault on women's work. It's uh, about Jenny's book uh, on uh, Thursday night, uh, also at 6 p.m. Uh, uh, Dan Berger will be talking to Jackie Wang, uh, who's the author of Carceral Capitalism from uh, Semia Text. Uh, uh, and uh, on Friday night, May 1st, uh, I'm sorry, that's Friday afternoon at 1 p.m., uh, thinking of the pandemic, capital or life, it's a choice we've all become aware of as everybody is trying to get us back to work as quickly as possible, uh, uh, no matter how risky it may be. Uh, uh, in that discussion, uh, we have uh, Asad Haider, Chinsi Arutza, Michael Hart, uh, Rodrigo Nunez and Sarah Mason. Uh, all of them should be very interesting. I know I will be listening uh, with eager ears. But now uh, uh, let's uh, let's open this discussion on uh, sinews of war and trade with uh, Lali Khalili. Um, I want to get there by a kind of uh, 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 slow and unhurried route, which befits nautical travel. Uh, and uh, I would like to start with elements of your biography, which kind of fascinate me. Uh, uh, you were, or you majored in Texas uh, in chemical engineering. Take us from Iran to chemical engineering for those sort of ports, points of your life. Um, first of all, let me thank you uh, and say how excited I am to be able to participate in Red May. Um, I, as you know, I have been trying, really hoping, wishing that I could come. And uh, because of the distance, the actual physical distance, that was not possible. But um, I suppose now this virtual uh, world that we're all living in has made it uh, much easier for me to participate. And I'm really excited about that. So thank you very much for the invitation. Again, in terms of the routes of travel that I took, I was... Um, um, I was a daughter of um, communist activists in Iran, and uh, they, my parents um, had been political prisoners um, after the revolution for a brief time, uh, but that uh, made it very difficult for me to be able to go to university in Iran because the universities at the time were fully state-owned and there were processes uh, it's called Gozinesh Selection, which looked at the political sort of uh, uh, background of the people that were going to go to university. And so my parents decided to send me off uh, to the US. Um, I had been born in the US uh, in 1968, uh, which gave me the possibility of being able to go back uh, once at, at the age of 17. And um, my parents chose the city of Houston uh, because my dad's best friend from university age lived there and I was gonna be going there and not staying with him, finishing a year of high school and then going to university. And so I did, I finished the year of high school in Houston, Texas. Um, and then I went on to University of Texas. And part of the reason that I studied engineering was because uh, my mother is a physician, was a physician, she's retired now, and, and I was wanting to follow her footsteps. And so I chose chemical engineering, like many children of uh, Middle Eastern and South Asian 
parents, many children of parents of Global South, the idea is that you get an engineering degree or you get a medical degree and that allows for you to sort of help out with your own country's uh, developmental plans. And so that engineering degree was quite um, an expected part of that. And I chose chemical engineering because it would allow me to do pre-med uh, so that I could eventually go to medical school and be like my mom. Uh, so I did chemical engineering and I worked for uh, in the summers after year three, um, after junior year, you were allowed to actually take summer engineering post, paid summer engineering, it was essentially internship. And I worked for two summers after my junior year and senior year um, at the Amoco Chocolate Bayou plant, which is, I don't think it's any longer owned by, I mean, I don't, I think it's a BP plant now. Um, and it produced benzene among other things. And it was a really interesting experience because in part, it seemed like the job of the summer engineers wasn't so much uh, doing engineering work. In the first summer that I was working there, part of my job was to actually figure out environmental legislation loopholes. Um, so, uh, so I kind of knew for sure back then that I really didn't want to be a chemical engineer. It was also interesting because I was warned that, uh, you know, uh, don't go to the back of the house to the plant itself. The guys in the plant don't like women, etc. And I actually found that, that the guys in the plant, many of whom were just the regular workers uh, in, in the place, were actually much more interesting, much more open minded. They were all union guys. And so we had really great conversations, whereas the front of the house, House, which was where the engineers were, 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 were they were mostly conservative politically. Um, so that was quite an interesting experience, sort of, um, of, of my, it was my first proper job. I mean, I had worked all through university to pay my way, but that was how I ended up not learning a little bit about sort of the divisions in workplaces in the US and um, still have, you know, I'm really glad to have done it. It was, it was quite an amazing experience. You know, it's interesting. I mean, I did have the experience too when I traveled in the global south with Chile to find out that everybody who I met was majoring in electrical engineering or chemical engineering for the same reasons you talk about. At the same time, uh, I arrived at Columbia in 1962 and Columbia had an engineering school. And what you realize is that there's a, there's a cutoff period for about 30 years, engineering had a huge prestige as physics did in the age of Einstein to the present. And then suddenly everybody was building business schools and management schools in the 70s and as basically in the 80s. And, and then it moved on to, uh, uh, to computer centers and something like that. And engineering sort of fell away as a notion. So, um, but that tracks with sort of the transformation of US economy, right? I mean, because in a way, you can totally see that the age in which engineering schools were so significant was the age of the rise of the US as the global powerhouse of production, the age of the American sublime of the big dams and the big factories and the big car production and, you know, all sorts of other things. And so it's unsurprising that when you get to the age of finance in the 1970s is when you have the switch happening from engineering schools to business schools. So, um, yeah, I, it, but it is also interesting because those engineering schools, both here in the UK and in the US, continue to be places where uh, people from the global south come and get educated. Um, they, it is, you know, still quite a significant sort of destination for uh, students who do want to, you know, they're, 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 the countries are still in the processes of producing production and infrastructure and all sorts of things. And so I think that that kind of an engineering education is really still appreciated. Um, by many. So uh, after you became a ch chemical engineer and uh, worked for management in a while, uh, uh, your next stop was over at Columbia. Uh, how, tell Why? me how you got there and, and what the thought process was. So I, after finishing my chemical engineering degree uh, and, and knowing that I didn't want to work in a plant, um, at the time, all of the big, uh, big six consulting accounting firms actually hired anybody they could out of the undergraduate and they would give them jobs. And an engineering degree was actually because we already were doing so much stuff on the computer. It was really great. It was, it prepared us. And so I actually worked at the time for um, uh, Anderson Consulting, which later became Accenture. Um, and, uh, and I worked for them for a couple of years and moved on to Pricewaterhouse for a couple of years. And during that time, I actually thought that what I was doing was saving up money to go to medical school. And I took uh, the MCATs uh, and then the really 
practically the week before I was supposed to start medical school, I had a massive crisis and really figured out that I didn't want to become a physician, uh, that I had, uh, that I'd really fantasized about doing so because I, because of my mother, but also the reality of it in the U S where you have to take money out. If you don't have family wealth, you have to take uh, huge loans out. And of course, medical schools is, is particularly expensive. And so the, it meant that the kind of medicine I wanted to practice, I had this fantasy of going and working for Medicine Sans Frontieres for Doctors Without Borders. I wouldn't have been able to do with, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in student loans. Um, so that really put a, put a crimp into things. And I was wondering what I was going to do and then decided, well, if I really wanted to do Medicine Sans Frontieres, maybe I didn't have to be a doctor. Maybe I could do refugee logistics or camp logistics or logistics end of it. And I thought that for doing that, what I would need to do is to do one of these professional um, international affairs degrees, which allows you to sort of work your way from engineering into that job. And, and so I ended up going to the School of International and Public affairs um, at Columbia. And one of the core texts we had to read that first, and the reason I chose Columbia was because I wanted to go to New York. Because New York is that city which, if even if you've never been to it, it feels familiar because it has in film and on television and you've read about it and you know it and it's the it's this kind of well it's a metro it's a world metropole it's the world imperial metropole and so in part i really wanted to be in new york um i i really wanted to have that kind of a life in a, and also having lived in first in texas and then georgia i really wanted to be in a city that had the kind of density and a pedestrian life that you don't easily find in the u.s um, so I ended up at the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia, and the very first text we had to read uh, was John Locke. And it came, I, I hadn't read any Locke, and it came as a massive shock that the basis, the core document of human rights was about protection of private property and the dispossession of the indigenous peoples elsewhere, etc. And so, uh, I was like, okay, maybe I don't want to do human rights work, uh, but I really want to learn the stuff that I had assumptions about that I didn't know enough about. And so I ended up doing a, a PhD with a number of really brilliant people at Columbia uh, who let me do what I wanted to do. So I had um, Charles Tilley and, uh, and I had Ira Katz Nelson um, and I had Tony Marks as my as uh, members of my committee and they were really kind of crucial in supporting me to do what I wanted to do. And that's how I kind of made my way from Iran's second city, Mashhad, to Texas, to Georgia, and finally to Colombia to a degree in political science. So uh, your dissertation at Columbia became uh, I believe the basis for your first book, Heroes and Martyrs of Palestine, uh, the Politics of Natu uh, National Commemoration. Uh, yeah. At the time uh, you wrote that the whole uh, distinction between memory and history, uh, uh, Pierre Nora with Lieu, Lieu de Memoire and uh, Morris Halbwex and so forth was a big sort of, uh, uh, one would call it liberal uh, talking point. Uh, uh, particularly the, the rigid distinction between the two. Uh, I, I believe the notion was that the, the thing about historical memory is that no one had actually experienced that memory. It was put together collectively uh, from everyone, but it was not something that any, any single individual would recognize as their own experience. Uh, I haven't read the book, but skimming it very quickly, it seems that you questioned the hard, hardness and fastness of that distinction. I do. And in part, it is because of the way that I did my research. I lived in a refugee camp, a Palestinian refugee camp uh, in Beirut for a time. And I talked to people who had experienced um, both the Nakba in 1948 and then the subsequent waves of violence that they had experienced as refugees in Beirut. Um, um, and in particular, I was really interested in, uh, in, in one um, special uh, sort of moment, and that is between the 1960s when the PLO becomes an, uh, an, an, an a group engaged in armed struggle, um, going all the way up to particularly the 1980s, 
um, and the Lebanese civil war and the Talazatar massacre over which the Syrian regime uh, had, um, uh, that they had, the Syrian regime had advised the Falange on that. Um, and then of course, Sabra and Shatila in which the Falange, the, the uh, Kataeb got their um, advisory uh, role from Israel. Um, and what I found was that when I was talking to people, uh, there was a sense in which they were telling me history. This was not solely about a kind of a memory that was not verifiable or that it was, uh, the, or, or that it was a kind of an individual uh, event. I mean, these people had lived through some of the most cataclysmic moments of history in the Middle East. And, and the ways in which they retold the story uh, was profoundly important to me. I really didn't want to acknowledge the distinction between history as that thing which is dependable because it comes from the archives and written documents versus collective memory or, or these kinds of uh, commemorative practices which are supposedly popular and therefore unreliable. Um, I mean, this has been a huge debate, particularly when it comes to instances of, uh, well, extreme violence by a much more powerful actor, in this instance, Israel uh, and its allies, um, and, and a much, uh, much sort of oppressed, repressed, dispossessed, expropriated um, group of people, which was Palestinians. Um, and, and so for me that it was really important. But the other thing that I really wanted to talk about in that, in that book was the fact that the way in which people spoke about their past is very much dependent on the degree to which they're currently politically mobilized. So in the 1960s and 70s, as Palestinians were mobilized, as they were you know, autochthonously organizing themselves into groups to struggle for their own rights, where there was a third worldist ethos, where there was a sense of global solidarity between liberation movements, the narrative that they told was one of uh, self-driven autonomous struggle. And so the past that they looked at was a series of uh, stories which were interpreted as pushing forward their agenda of liberation. But once they were defeated in Lebanon, but also as the human rights discourses began to emerge, that narrative of autonomous pushing forward of a political agenda gives way to a kind of a human rights discourse that actually demands an external power to come and intervene, that demands not kind of a solidarity of liberation movements, but uh, the, the munificence of human rights or humanitarian organizations. And for me, that shift also tracked with a shift from a kind of an epic genre of history to, an, to a tragic one. And it was, a, it was one that I thought was really important to talk about. So, um, it, uh, it's 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 a book of mine that never came out in paperback. If you order it, it's print on demand, and I'm always a little bit bitter about that because I actually is I'm quite fond of that book. Um, many of the people that I interviewed for that have become very good old friends now, and so uh, and I'm still very committed to, to 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 the Palestinian cause and so as an ally and in solidarity. And so I think that that uh, yeah that it, it it is it's a book that I feel very fondly for now written almost 20 years ago so yeah it is available on kindle and i did download it for only nine dollars so i think that that part is good you know i just want to say also growing up from within the zionist narrative and zionist memory uh my reaction has almost ha has been the discovery that almost every element of that particular memory is false and the only way i found that out is by essentially acquainting myself with history uh, you know, the story is always told, oh, uh, first of all, the Palestinians were called the Arabs for many years. You know, the Arabs did this, or the, or the Arabs of 22 countries, why wouldn't they let us have this one? Or, uh, you know, their leaders told them to run away from Palestine during the first war, so uh, the invading armies could have a free field of fire against the Jews. I mean, one particular... Uh, uh, a uh, crazy made up story, bit of fake news as we call it now, uh, the other. So it's, uh, it's funny. I mean, I know there've been very interesting books written about Jewish memory and uh, Jewish history, particularly uh, 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 Yerushalmi, uh, who was at uh, Columbia too. So Zakor, I think is the name of it, it's quite good. But anyway, uh, 
I mean, it's, it's important to note that both history and collective memory align themselves with particular forms of struggle and particular forms of power. History is often written by the victors. And so the victors also have the ability to define the contours of a narrative. And I think that that in part is what, I'm inter what I was interested in, is that in the absence of a state with all of the kind of accoutrement of a state, the possibility to educate via um, you know, by t school textbooks or the possibility to educate via television or, or national monuments or national uh, processions uh, among the fragmented population that is spread across a whole lot of places. How do people remember? So I think it is, it is interesting. The con I, I, I don't like to ever make a kind of a blanket statement about history and memory in part because I know the context is so incredibly important. The political context is so incredibly important to both of, to both of those things. Um, but yes, uh, it's interesting always for me, I mean, in, in preparing for writing that book, I read just about everything that you could find and, and on, on Jewish memory. And it's not just Holocaust memory, but also Jewish memory in the sense of the ways in which particular kind of past narratives before the Shoah are remembered of, of for example, pogroms in Eastern Europe that tend to be um, tend to be actually kind of forgotten because it, because the subsequent narrative of Shoah is so horrifying and so enormous that it kind of you know that that other story also is to me really interesting or or the histories of histories and memories of um, Arab Jews of of the Jewish people who lived in the Arab world for you know hundreds of years and so that to me is also quite interesting. Um, let's move on to your next book, which I have read. Uh, yes. It's called. Uh, uh, time in the shadows and remind me of the subtitle it Count counterinsurgency in the confinement in counterinsurgencies um essentially uh, uh, that book was written during the quote unquote war on terror uh when uh suddenly as if for the first time uh counterinsurgency doctrine appeared as this kind of new way of war all of us who had lived through the Vietnam War uh, remembered a lot of the particular notions of strategic hamlets and, and where they came from. My, my uh, uncle uh, was an important defense consultant at Rand Corporation. And uh, I remember in 1964, when Vietnam was just getting started, he gave me the book that everybody was reading in Rand. It was called uh, Defeating Communist Insurgency by Sir Robert Thompson. The Malaya model. So, of course, your whole whole book is about how most of these particular uh, new innovations in military strategy come from uh, a long history of colonial wars, uh, starting from the uh, uh, the wars against the uh, First Nations in America to uh, you know the Philippines to uh, uh, particularly France and Algeria, uh, and uh, uh, in in some cases you find really direct connections that have been kind of suppressed. The, the fact, for example, that the, literally the, uh, the torturers of the Battle of Algiers were the ones who literally came over and gave training uh, both to uh, uh, troops in the South, I think at Fort Benning in uh, uh, Georgia, but also uh, particularly to Brazil, uh, uh, Paul Osares and... and, and uh, Argentina was an Argentina was another one where there was a lot of this kind of a cross training by the guys who had been in Algeria. And in fact, one of the things that was most famously done is that both in Algeria and in Argentina, helicopters would take dissidents and drop them into the water. And so that was something that was one particular way that this this kind of model of counterinsurgency traveled in the 1970s, at least. Right. Um the uh you you look at it in the uh in the perspective of uh a liberal society uh and how uh in almost every one of these cases there's a moment where what's really happening comes out in public whether it's Milai or abu grave and everybody writes all these editorials about how it's lost its way uh whereas in fact it's all part of the model as what one goes along, it's just not it's it's disavowed uh, what exactly it will will be required. Uh, obviously, the whole distinction between uh, enemy combatants and soldiers uh, one could trace it back to the way the Nazis treated partisans during World War II and so forth. Uh, um, what I was most fascinated, though, uh, 
uh, in detail was the way you studied textually uh, the forms of law and the elaborations of a kind of uh, uh, insane legal reason, uh, which was a good uh, uh, analog to the insane strategic reason that one finds in game theory, uh, where a lot of the people that we since recognize, uh, old William Barr, who appeared at Trump's side, and all of these people in the Federalist Society who represent some kind of uh, uh, almost medieval uh, form of reasoning that's applied to whatever legal situ situation there is, and, and through precedents, uh, essentially discovers whatever needs to be discovered to excuse whatever form of action needs to be excused. Could you uh, elaborate on that a bit? Yeah, I mean, I have to say, I the, the, it's quite interesting that you like the law section because it is actually also my favorite section, in part because um, I, I think I'm a bit of a student. I like being a bit of a student every time. I like learning constantly in the process of doing projects. And one of the things that I really um, learned uh, to do, and, and, and I'm still learning, I'm still a student of it, is how to read legal texts. So for me, reading the, reading the text of Supreme Court decisions, for example, or the dissenting decisions, was enormously significant to thinking about this, but so were learning to read uh, other kinds of cases. Um, and one of the things that was very interesting for me, and, and part of the reason that law figures so loom so large in this, is because of the um, the constant invocation of law and the rule of law as being that thing that supposedly stops violence or stops uh, the, the, the incredible sort of torture and confinement uh, or the uses of uh, these bodily forms of coercion that powerful states engage in. And, and I, you know, I don't trust the law. <laughs> the law works for some and does not work for many. It's, uh, it is an instrument of power and it is one that, for example, uh, use, it was used for centuries to bolster slavery in the US. It has been used to justify genocide. It is today used to justify in the US, but also other parts of, but in Europe and other parts of uh, the Americas to, uh, to suppress indigenous people or African-Americans or black people or people that are marginalized in some ways. And so to me, it was really important to take law off its pedestal and to say the way that it became an arena of contestation. I didn't want to say that it was entirely useless because some of the most heroic people actually in the story, in the sordid story that I tell, are the people who, who were lawyers and actually some of them were military lawyers. And so it was really important to talk about that contestation, but also to acknowledge that the rule of law always has been an adjunct of power. So- yeah, Yes, and to, uh, to uh, move on to that, we'll retur return to that a little bit when we talk about uh, sinews of empire. I, I said sinews of war and trade. I get that wrong all the time. But I want to say that I've been struck too uh, in the context of the judicialization of politics by liberalism at the, the becoming ad hocness of law, that literally law has become more and more ad hoc, uh, particularly as it's retreated to. Uh, the common law in constitutional arguing with, with sort of strange precedents that are taken from dissenting views or uh, you know, are, are, are taken from things that are rejected in earlier decisions, but then become precedents with the common law. And also particularly in uh, essentially the, the, the international law that's needed for capital to keep accumulating and turning over fast. Uh, it, it used to be thought uh, argued essentially by Hayek uh, that the important thing was to take laws away from legislatures to make them really clear that this is the uh, that, that everybody follows and then society will function of itself but capital doesn't need clear laws capital needs a totally flexible law that can be abrogated at any moment when some new way of accumulating becomes possible uh, and I think as as we you know look through the uh, the, the, the kind of, oh, well, for example, the, uh, the use of uh, uh, arbitration courts and something, uh, in introducing the, uh, abrogating one's own national law and just turning it into a couple of lawyers in a room, uh, 
in, in back rooms. So it's a, even something else to uh, what you're mentioning is also relevant. And I don't talk about that necessarily in either of the books, but it is something that has been really interesting to me has been the ease with which Trump, for example, has been able to roll back environmental legislation or environmental regulations because the law was taken out of the hand of the legislators and was put in the hand of the bureaucrats and the moment that you do that where there is not an apparatus of representation behind it at least just some form of liberal democracy behind it that becomes something that can be rolled back so easily and so that to me is also interesting that there is this there's this entire amorphous ambiguous body that surrounds constitutional uh, and legislated law, which also counts as that part of that body. And, and arbitration is the one that I write about, but environmental regulations is another one. Um, as it's, so I think, yes, you're absolutely right that that kind of a Hayekian fantasy has come to pass. It really has. Uh, right, I do wanna make a pitch too, that we have a, 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 a panel called What Was Liberalism? which will deal precisely with this. Aziz Rana, who's working on a, a book about uh, constitution veneration will be on it. I'll actually be talking about the, uh, the, the 1937 uh, Walter Libman Colloquium in Paris and the attempt to uh, resolve liberalism. Uh, and uh, uh, Alexander Zevin will be talking about his new book from Verso, Liberalism at Large. So I mean, it will have a lot to do with how it construes the law and so forth. Uh, but I, I do. I would like to read uh, uh, some things that you've written, which I, I really like. Uh, uh, one, of course, you just transcribed Swift, but it's so good that I think it has to be read. Um, uh, this is in a section called Precedents and Legal Progenitors. And Swift says, it's a maxim among these lawyers that whatever has been done before may be legally done again. And therefore they take special care to record all the decisions formally made against common justice and the general reason of mankind. Uh, these under the name of precedents they produce as authorities to justify the most iniquitous opinions and the judges never fail at, at directing accordingly. I mean, which is wonderful. And then, you know, uh, particularly I, uh, one of the decisions you cite is this famous decision that Nick Estes talks about where 40 Dakota, Dakota warriors were condemned to death for simply resisting, uh, for fighting in a war against the United States. Um, uh, and then you spend a lot of time tracking John Wu's uh, wonderful legal mind that literally picks up bits from every colonial war, not even ones that are American. So to, uh, he, he cites Israeli law as a precedent uh, for obeying in America. So, um, uh, you know, uh, you, you write, the very use of precedent is a discursive positioning of present juridical text in the context of a tradition with such depth and breadth as to provide by its sheer volume, repetition and familiarity the justifications we require today of our legal reasoning. The density and stickiness of these precedents work in favor of maintaining structures of power as they are, no matter how unjust or historically anachronistic those precedents may be. Um, anyway, uh, uh, we'll get back to some of this in commercial law, but I, I, we better get start talk about uh, your wonderful book, uh, sinews of uh, war and trade, um, which is, uh, uh, it, it has the rhythm of an unhurried sea voyage, uh, where one simply looks around at everything one passes and tries to understand it. I did mention Moby Dick and my enthusiastic endorsement of the book, uh, and, and also Bradell's Mediterranean, and I meant that in, in just one very simple way, that you're very aware of the relation of every particular you see to a totality. Uh, and th that is essentially something that's rather rare in our empirically minded age where things are just there and, and, and cited, uh, that it's wonderful. Uh, uh, Bl Blake talks about seeing a world in a grain of sand. Uh, and maybe you can uh, elaborate a little on uh, 
one, that sand is by bulk the most traded, carried commodity uh, in ships and why it is so, and where the sand that is used to dredge the harbors uh, uh, is taken. One would think intuitively that it's from the deserts because they have a lot of sand over there, but in fact, it comes halfway around the world. I mean, that whole section is, I think, just dazzling. So uh, I, I will let you describe it. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you very much for that comparison. I mean, obviously, I'm nowhere near the... I, Moby Dick is one of my most favorite books, in part because it does everything. Um, I love its kind of vast sloppiness. Uh, and of course, the language in it is so beautiful. And Brodel was actually a major inspiration as I was writing this, in part because he... Um, uh, there's just, he, he, as you say, connects everything. I'm, I'm a very bad political scientist. Um, I don't believe in rigor or elegance. I don't believe in monocausal explanations. I do think everything is connected. And I do think that the it's, it's a machine of many moving parts, everything that we look at in the world. And in some ways, I wanted to sort of show the complexity of this system, because I also think that a lot of the stories that people tell about maritime worlds um, tends to focus on one aspect. And I wanted to show how these all of these aspects were interconnected and the stories could not be prized apart really. Um, in fact, the book was originally twice the length it is now and I had to cut it back because otherwise Verso wouldn't be very happy with me. And so um, I cut it back radically and there are bits that are coming out hopefully in articles as I'm writing right now. But in the question of sand, it was one of the things that I was most interested in, in part because maybe this, is, this has got something to do with my engineering background. So I was really interested in dredging and land reclamation. And, and, and in part, this was really quite significant because dredging and land reclamation have been really, really very important for the making of harbors in the, uh, in the Gulf, in the Persian slash Arabian Gulf, um, but also in any of the other ports that you actually look at, the creation of the port infrastructure is, um, is dependent on dredging and land reclamation. Charmaine Chua, who I'm very happy to say I'm going to be on a panel with on the 23rd of May, I believe, um, has written about this wonderfully when it comes to um, Singapore, which is, of course, today, I think it's something like 150% of the size it was some decades ago um, because of this land reclamation. So one, I, I wanted to follow this and I wanted to tell the story that at once told about sort of the technical characteristics of the use of sand, but also what that meant in terms of its politics of it. So the materiality of sand had something to do with the politics of it. And I wanted to put those two things together. It becomes clear um, that you cannot really use sand from the desert for land reclamation, for making concrete, um, etc. Because in part, when you're making concrete in order to do land reclamation, you need to have grains of sand that are uneven and not necessarily spherical. So there are different sizes within like one handful of sand, you have different sizes of grain and the sphere and the, and the uh, grains are not spherical, but they're different shapes. And in fact, if you Google if um, as grains of sand under the microscope, you'll see exactly the difference in the look of uh, sand. So sand that is eroded by air tends to be both more spherical and more evenly sized, whereas sand that emerges out of uh, erosion by water tends to be much more uneven, both in shape and in uh, grain, uh, grain shape and in grain size. And so um, it becomes much better for sticking concrete together because concrete comes from mixing cement with sand and sand that is uh, coming from water eroded backgrounds works much better. The problem is that in a lot of these places, in particular, so for example, on, on the Red Sea, the, um, the ocean floor is not sandy in parts of it that are close to the shore. They tend to be very heavy coral, heavy and hard coral uh, reefs. Um, and there are other parts of it where the sand is actually brought in because of, uh, has been dumped there because of say, for example, work that was done on land has been dumped into the water. So again, the grains are not very good. So while you're dredging them in order to deepen the harbor, you can't use that sand. So you have to actually import it from other places. And um, aside from building construction, which is of course enormously important uh, as a sort of a destination for this kind of a sand import in, uh, in the Gulf countries, you also find that there is, um, 
there is also a huge amount of uh, um, sand needed in order to create these harbors. And the places that they come from, there are some that are legal. So Australia, for example, has become a source for a lot of this kind of sand, but a lot of also illegal sand mining. So uh, Myanmar, uh, Cambodia are seeing their river sand being dredged illegally and exported illegally to uh, Singapore. Uh, in India, activists, uh, local activists, environmental activists from villages who see their riverbeds disappearing have been killed by the sand mafias. You see uh, beaches disappearing in little islands in Indonesia, again, illegally mined for that kind of, uh, for that kind of illegal export. And so it's huge business and it is one that is devastating to local economies, particularly in riparine and river economies and beach coastal economies um, and, and also coastal lives because they are completely and totally eroding it. Uh, beaches become unstable, uh, infrastructure that is dug in becomes unstable. People's livelihoods disappear because uh, you know, as beaches disappear, people are not, people can't go and do fishing or or other forms. So in a way, it is um, the, the sand thing in one place ends up being this, the need for sand in one place ends up being very devastating in, in, in an entirely other part of the world. And in part, that's what I wanted to show was that one thing that happens in Dubai or in Dammam or whatever actually has ripple effects in lots of other places. No, exactly. And uh, one of the brilliant things of that following that particular uh, ripple effect is uh, in your discussion of uh, super tankers uh, and the recreation of harbors, uh, we find that this is something that is done again and again. Uh, just after a new harbor has been created and dredged out, uh, there's a need for one, I don't know, five years later because the tankers have gotten bigger. And so there's this kind of frenzied uh, uh, effort to widen and create new ports, which again affects this trade at the other side of the world and, and uh, uh, leaves people in even worse situations who have riverine economies. So I, I think, you know, uh, that whole uh, section, of which of course I knew nothing about dredging and so on, was fascinating just, just to read it through. Um, uh, you talk about ports, routes, oh, the elements of ports you see as routes, harbors, legal infrastructures and the kind of hinterlands uh, behind them. And, and, and so you deal with the histories of each of these particular uh, elements uh, and how, how, what, what seems to drive them, for example. Uh, the, the notion of the rise and fall of, of certain ports like the fall of Aden and the rise of Jebel Ali as being related less to economic, uh, strict economic factors uh, than having to do with the political, uh, uh, political factors. Um, uh, could you could you elaborate on that a little bit? And yeah, I mean it's quite interesting because uh, one of the things that you often hear is, well, this port should thrive because it is on a good route and it has a good natural harbor. Uh, and it has all of the sort of geographic felicities that would make a harbor a perfect port. And of course, Aden is the perfect case. Um, and, and the comparison with Jabal Ali is particularly noteworthy because Aden has a natural deep harbor, um, one that is hard in, in terms of its uh, in, uh, both the ground and, and the way it doesn't easily erode. It doesn't need to be constantly deepened. Uh, it sits um, so close to Bab al-Mandab and to the route through Suez. So it is on an incredibly busy sea route. Um, Jabal Ali, by comparison, sits on shallows. Uh, its approach has to be constantly dredged in order for bigger laden ships not to sink into the mud. Uh, it is actually out of the way, really, of the sea routes. Um, it has created the routes to it. And what one can see is that um, the, the end of uh, colonialism in Aden, uh, in some ways, uh, shifts the, the, the usability of that port, which used to be the fourth most important fueling, bunkering port in the world, um, both for coal and then later for oil, 
it shifts away from that. And in part, it has to do with the end of colonialism there. It has to do with subsequent wars. It has to do with the undermining of, uh, of sort of autonomous action there with the removal of possible investment in the ports, et cetera. Whereas Dubai, uh, and its ruling um, elite are rewarded by the British masters. Um, and in fact, the end of Aden shifts all the business to both Kuwait, Bahrain, and to Dubai. And that means that these end up these cities, which these city states, um, these countries, which were under the protectorate of the British, end up benefiting from. Uh, from the fall of Aden. So in some ways, these things are all interconnected and I tell that story and I, and there's lots of other factors, of course, um, involved as well. The ease with which capital can move around, the exploitation of migrant labor, etc. cetera. Um, but I think that it is also important to acknowledge that in this instance, colonialism uh, handed the Aden's business over to the to the much more um, uh, amenable uh, ruling uh, families of the Gulf uh, Emirates. So that is a story that I try to tell in there. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that just having a fine natural harbor is not enough. It's the political factors end up being really quite significant. Well, uh, you also have uh, excellent and detailed chapters on labor and particularly on the difference between uh, shipboard labor and dockside labor. Uh, the dockside labor seems to be, uh, particularly during the decolonization period, uh, where a lot of the resistance to capital and to colonialism arose. Uh, and the uh, shipboard la labor also is something that seems to have been transformed by the physical transformation of the places in the harbor and what's involved in a ship stopping off in port. Uh, uh, that used to be in the, uh, e even in the 50s and 60s, uh, if a ship was a tramp steamer or something, it would literally stop off in a port and then wait to get a new cargo. Uh, so you had this whole mythology of the sailor's liberty in a week at shore and everything that grew up around it. You know, the port was right next to the city. I, I studied in detail uh, the evolution of Valparaiso, uh, uh, you know, and, and what happens over time as the harbor becomes dredged and uh, the need for something bigger forces it outside of the city, uh, plus the time that the ship spends in port is so, uh, so reduced that this whole notion of liberty and the shore patrol and whatever just disappears. People are in and out and flown. I mean, so, so that in itself. There are other factors as well, because I think that the shipboard labor is nowhere near as numerous as it used to be because of containerization and because of automation aboard ships. And so where you had ships where they had 100 sailors on them or 200 sailors in the age of sail, um, as you, you move to the age of steam and then from coal to oil and to the automation and to containers. Um, when I was, when I went on two container ships, one of them at the time was the largest container ship um, on uh, a float on the sea at 390 meters in length. And it had a total of 30 sailors on board. And so if you think about it, this is a small city with only 30 people. And I think that that actually in some ways removes the ability of seafarers to organize aboard ships in a way that dockers um, still can. Um, and you can see that there's, um, there's a, um, there's a insurance company called the Strike Club, although they have just recently changed their name to Standard Club. But this, this, the Strike Club kind of tra tracks uh, strikes uh, on the docks and on board ships. And it is really interesting to, I, I get their newsletter all the time. And it's very interesting to see that while at any given time, there are there's some number of strikes going on on the docks. For months now, I've not seen a single strike aboard a ship or for a, at a shipping company. And I think that that, or in, on, on board a shipping company by seafarers. And I think that also says something about the change in the condition of work um, in a way that actually removes the power of seafarers um, uh, whereas the dockers have that disruptive ability in a way that allows them some degree of leverage as labor organizers, um, as, as labor activists, or as, um, uh, as, as a striking force. And you talk about the relation between the, uh, the extensive use of flags of convenience from Liberia or Panama and 
the disbanding of the, let's say the US merchant marine, uh, is it true that it doesn't exist anymore because essentially the, the ships are flagged everywhere and uh, you know, the, uh, what is it, what's the percentage of- uh, I'm, I'm the exact percentage of the seafarers in the US that are still operating. But if you re if you recall, you guys still have the Jones Act, which means that if you have coastal trade going from one place in the US to another place in the US, the ships have to be flagged to the US and they have to have therefore American seafarers aboard. And so the Jones Act is actually what um, to some extent protects some degree, some number of the merchant marine still. Um, I it, but of course, the, the flags of convenience um, are often in the US flown on international um, cargo uh, and elsewhere in the world on just about any kind of ship. Um, and what's interesting is that the, most of the registries where flags of convenience, um, are, where ships flying flags of convenience are registered, tend to be allies of the US. And many of, in many of these countries, the registry company, which takes the fees and manages the flag, um, actually is headquartered in the US, many of them uh, in Northern Virginia, near Washington, DC. Uh, the Liberia company is there, the Marshall Islands uh, International Ship Registry is in uh, Virginia. And so what happens is that in many of these instances, the profits from the registration of the ships, the countries that, you know, if, if one argument is that, well, open registries allows Liberia or Marshall Islands to have a source of income, well, actually, all the fees from those registrations end up going to get end up getting expatriated to the U.S. Um, so I think that that also those flags of convenience, uh, which John McPhee, um, a wonderful essayist who writes for the New York Times, has written about, and so did Alan Sekula. In fact, Alan Sekula was one of the inspirations for for my work, and it was his flag of flags of convenience work that was of interest to me. As they have written, it is the way to for shipping companies to circumvent labor laws regulations taxes environmental legislation um anything that you can imagine um and insurance even so so in a way uh the flags of convenience have you know allowed for concentration of shipping capital while at the same time uh, creating a multi-tiered system of seafaring um, where uh, not everybody in the global south, for example, doesn't get paid as much as their no global north uh, counterparts, which also creates massive divisions. I mean, it's a, it's a brilliant form to divide and roll the, the workers themselves aboard a ship or globally. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's a quite a devastating thing. Uh, and I'm not the first person to write about it. There's a, a historian, Rodney Carlyle, who's written two books about it and his books were wonderfully useful. But it was also actually one of the things that I interviewed about and talked to the most in part because it is one of the causes that the International Transport Workers Federation has taken up is uh, their monitoring of flags of convenience is quite significant. So I think that's, uh, it, it is one of the kind of astonishing bits. The more you read about it, the more it becomes really unbelievable what kind of chicanery and charlatanry goes into these, these forms of avoiding taxation or regulation or accountability. Uh, I think I'll try to ask sort of one more very general and complex uh, question and, and then open it up. Well, well, seconding what you said, recommending everybody uh, watch Forgotten Space by Alan Sakula and read Fish Story and also Looking for a Ship by McPhee, all sort of wonderful, uh, wonderful work. Uh, I wanted to uh, bring up the question of imperialism uh, yeah. for a moment and how it's been redefined. Uh, you are a contributor to a wonderful issue of Viewpoint uh, with a great essay by Salar Mohandesi on the difficulty of uh, pinning down any particular description uh, of imperialism. Uh, what, what you say in that, uh, uh, in the interview there is that imperialism is uh, the will to make the world safe for the investment of capital, which is kind of dominated by capital in the US in terms of writing the laws uh, uh, that allows capital to uh, create its circuits and keep turning over faster and faster and uh, uh, creating more value. Uh, the, uh, uh, there's no question that that particular function of the state now, which is essentially making the world safer capital accumulation and flexibly altering whatever laws need to be altered is uh, 
what is in fact happening, particularly the US government is, uh, is engaged in that a lot. But the concrete manner that it does so uh, produces some very interesting questions. Let's take arbitration, for example. Obama was uh, es essentially uh, championing the uh, uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership and trying to push it through against many members in the party. One of the things people objected to is the fact that companies outside of the US could sue US states for uh, trying to pass environmental laws for interfering with their future profits. Uh, the thing that strikes me as very odd about what a US president is doing here is he is surrendering sovereignty uh, that's supposedly located within a state or inside a country to some sort of amorphous body of uh, lawyers uh, on the other side of the world. And it's very hard to square when one thinks of imperialism in the 19th century, it's all state centric and it involves finding a place in the sun, competing with other states and so forth. Uh, so uh, one of the theories that I find fascinating, or one of the ways of formulating this whole uh, sense in which cap, uh, there is a kind of, there, there used to be an argument between uh, have we reached a totally transnational world or are the nations still around? I think this was, you know, about 2000 and when globalization first came about, everybody would argue one position or another. But it seems that something different is happening from either one, that the state is involved in creating this kind of strange sovereignty where capital is both national and not capital, uh, national whenever it's needed. Uh, particularly if you look at uh, Keller Easterling's book describing uh, all the forms that, uh, uh, that capital has of uh, uh, warehouses that are in and not in a country, uh, uh, cities that have duplicate cities, logistic cities quite across from them. So the city government, depending on what it needs to do, can do it either outside of the law extraterritorially or within. Uh, it's this creation of a no space uh, that is the space of capital's reproduction. Uh, there's a new book from Verso called Planetary Mind by Martin Arboleda, uh, which I like very much, who argues very provocatively that uh, though imperialism is real and many of the things that dependency theory, the theorists were talking about, on a higher level, what's really going on in terms of capital is it's a pursuit of relative surplus value uh, around the world. And, and, and that uh, that is what's driving capital rather than any kind of national uh, goals. And that, uh, uh, that we tend to lose sight of this class struggle dimension when we, we encase it within kind of states that are seen somehow as, as uh, at least uh, actors that have a solidity that are liable to last. And then what we have is this incredible centrifugal force. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. See, I would say, I would say that there are, there, there was a recent, uh, okay, so, there, so I subscribe to this um, data visualization uh, 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 newsletter called um, Cap Visual Cap Visual Capitalist Capital Visualist something like that, um, and it produces really amazing data viz. And one of the graphs that it produced about a week or so ago was the number of billionaires and millionaires around the world. And what was mind-blowingly striking was that in both absolute numbers. And in relative numbers, the United States still has the highest number of millionaires and billionaires, which means that the processes of capital accumulation anywhere in the world are probably actually sending a good amount of this back to the US. When I see that, despite the fact that China is becoming a center of capital and it is really investing in all sorts of places and in some places more exploitatively than others and in some places in, in a, you know, in a, um, 
a much more solidaristic way or whatever. I mean, there are lots of different, there's a, a quite complexity to Chinese investment. Or when I look at Dubai, which has become a very important source of capital in the Middle East, um, Gulf actually capital has become a very important source of investment in the Middle East, in Qatar and Abu Dhabi, you know, investing elsewhere. You, you become aware that it, of course, yes, you have a multi-centric world in which investments are now coming, if not just from New York, not just from London or from the global north, but also from the countries in the global south. But for me, what is really important is that the rules for accumulation, the fora in which uh, people uh, dispute uh, the states, as you said, environmental or labor legislations, the spaces uh, which are defined as spaces of capital and how they're defined, the standards of engineering, the standards of accounting, um, all of this is still coming from the US and to a lesser degree from the North Atlantic uh, countries. Um, so UK, Denmark, etc. So to me, the fact that the parameters of capital accumulation are still being decided despite Trump's best efforts to dismantle these transnational um, institutions which have served the US extremely well, global capital also, but the US um, has been extremely well served by the WTO and IMF and um, all of these different organizations. Despite Trump dismantling that, I also still see that all of those kinds of things that I'm talking about, which aid the accumulation of capital, still emanate from this corner of the world. And so I, I, ever since people have talked about globalization, removing the nation state, I've always said, no, it's it really, the nation state is still there. It serves different kinds of function and variegated functions. Um, and, uh, and, and capital is now being accumulated beyond the North Atlantic metropoles, but the parameters for the accumulation of capital are still setting from there. And it's gonna be a long time. I think it's gonna be at least a couple of generations before China can so, you know, so radically reshape those kinds of things, the rules, the regulations, the laws, the accounting or engineering standards, et cetera. So I think that in some ways, I, I do still think that we still live, and perhaps it, not for my children's generation, but for my generation, we still live in the era of US empire. Uh, and I think that's, uh, I acknowledge that the US empire is very different than its predecessor. So it's very different than the British, for example, um, in, in that it really wants a kind of a global capital to flourish. But I also think that part of the reason that it does is because it benefits disproportionately from that flourishing of global capital uh, for whatever reasons. I mean, everything is denominated in dollars, in the dollars still. So I think that that's, you know, that is uh, still quite a significant factor, I think, that we have to take into account. Um, let me ask some questions from the uh, from chat. Um, yeah. Someone says that people often see law as a way to control capital, uh, but Lale points to laws embedding with capital, uh, which seems to make capital control highly limited. Can 21st century law really produce adequate capital controls? Probably not, in part because, for example, the things that I write about, I was fascinated by arbitration. And again, because of my fascination with reading all these texts of arbitrations, I was desperately looking for these arbitral texts. But for most instances, except for very old historical arbitration cases that came out in the 50s or 60s, it is almost impossible to be able to find the, the, the text of these arbitrations because classification, um, uh, uh, there, there are classification rules around them and they're, they're not made public. And what is fascinating is the extent to which Every time that a transnational corporation, a transnational capital or local cap uh, corporation takes a state to one of these international uh, tribunals, arbitration tribunals, the state loses, uh, just loses. Um, and, and it's about wages, wage regulation. It's about environmental regulation. It is about uh, corrupt practices of the corporations. It doesn't matter, they just lose. And one of the things that I point to, which I find that I think, again, this is where really knowing the histories of these things is quite useful, is that it becomes very clear that the, the, the these in, incredibly significant and main and, and kind of uh, streamlined arbitration procedures uh, and the, uh, the international commercial arbitration procedures becoming streamlined emerges 
as a response to decolonization and to the processes of nationalization of oil first in after uh, after the Russian Revolution, then later after the Mexican Revolution, and so I think or Mexican nationalization of oil, and then uh, of course the Iranian nationalization of oil, and so in some ways these investor disputes, these arbitration disputes, these legal procedures. Uh, sorry, not these peace processes, these legal procedures have been put into place precisely to forestall the possibility of post-colonial, anti-colonial states actually having any kind of control over their own economies. So it, to me, that, that role that law plays as, in this instance, an adjunct of capital is really quite important. The other thing that I think is really important is that the U.S. sees itself as the enforcer of these laws. And I think as long as the U.S. does so, whether through the force of sanctions or the, you know, violence, uh, its navies flying around, etc., cetera, um, sailing around, steaming around, um, that means that the U.S. is actually still behind these kinds of legal processes that encourage the accumulation of capital. So um, I really don't see law as placing huge, as being able to place huge limits. But then also the world is changing in front of our eyes right now. And I don't want to say it will never happen because this might be the moment in which there is, things are shifting under our very own eyes. Um, and so it's very difficult to tell what might happen in 10 years time because of the transformations that are being wrought by COVID right now. So uh, there's also an interesting uh, process where an innovation that's tried out in what used to be called the third world or the global south is brought back to work in America. Uh, we saw that what used to be called black propaganda, which the CIA gave to other countries becomes fake news in this country. Uh, arbitration is also something that has uh, introduced in the US the boilerplate agreements that one uh, does, uh, clicks on uh, for tech companies are essentially, as someone said, a way that takes you out of the legal system that the Constitution provides and put you in another one where you're subject to, to arbitration. So uh, the, also uh, NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, again, uh, uh, you're continually offered uh, ways of getting out of power. So these things become, whether they're applied abroad or within the US, they become the best practices uh, of capital. Uh, and the visual capitalists that I was talking about, the data visualization network, uh, sorry, newsletter, it also actually a few weeks ago had a really interesting uh, image of the as uh, fine print for each of the apps that you buy or each of the softwares that you install on your, and the fine prints for them went on for pages and pages and pages and pages. Some of them took, I think they like counted how many hours it took to actually read them. And some of them were double the length of Shakespearean plays. So, um, you know, so that is, as you say, that is another form in which that the small print, the fine print is, uh, becomes a kind of a constraint on uh, us uh, and it becomes a kind of a protection, uh, a, a kind of a moat to protect the corporations from us. So, uh, so yeah, that, that's, that's a very good example, actually. What do you think are possible choke points uh, for resisting capital along the line of logistics, the supply chain, uh, and so forth? I mean, obviously, Jasper Burns and Joshua Clover and others, and Charmaine herself, who was active in this, and Katie Fox Hodes, who was also active in this, these kinds of activisms, uh, activist uh, sort of movements, have pointed out to the fact that there are ways in which um, an alliance between, say, port workers and actually other political groups. I think this is what both Katie, Charmaine, and others point to, um, Rafif Ziada and others, that it is really important to acknowledge that workplace forms of trying to uh, disrupt, so Docker's uh, strikes, will really best succeed if it is combined with also political movements and alliances outside. So they all point to the fact that, for example, the Stop the Boat movements that happened during the Occupy and then later against Israeli ships on the west coast of the US, best succeeded when the dockers unions 
made alliances with citizens groups uh, around anti-racist stuff or around um, pro-Palestinian causes, etc. So I think that that becomes a very important one. Political mobilization has to be seen as not just being about union uh, organizing, but also about making these kinds of alliances with other groups around there. And I think that that's quite important. So, for example, um, I can see Black Lives Matters uh, alliance with unions to stop, for example, the transport of guns uh, could be a really useful way to also um, create a choke point for the trans, you know, for the transportation of that kind of weapon, weapon dollar, weapon capital. Um, but I also think that uh, some of the other forms that one can, uh, the, the kinds of choke points that people talk about actually end up being sometimes quite accidental. So, uh, or, or end up being unintended consequences. So one of the interesting things that we're seeing right now, right at this very moment is that because the incompetent uh, crown prince of Saudi Arabia decided to get into an oil price war with Russia, we suddenly have a glut of oil at the very moment in which demand has dropped from, I think I was seeing a statistic of 100 uh, billion barrels, barrels a day to down to a third uh, or two thirds of that. And so, so you have suddenly uh, an incredible uh, glut of oil. People don't, don't know where to store the oil. There are ships at anchor all around the coast, west coast of the US and in the Gulf of Mexico and near Singapore and near Hong Kong and elsewhere, which are essentially floating crude storages. And I was seeing an, an, an account in a story in Bloomberg um, today that uh, in a week or two, they, uh, oil producers may be forced to shut down their production. And so, or a, some, a third of their production may have to be shut down. And they were already saying that in North Dakota, a third of the frack uh, and companies have either gone bankrupt or have just shut down their wells. Uh, the, the, the refineries are shutting down both in the Gulf of Mexico and on the west coast of the US. Um, and there has been threats by Trump that the US may not take delivery of Saudi oil. And so the Saudis are scrambling to figure out where to send that oil that they were was shipping towards the US. And so in a way, this is an unintended consequence and one that was maybe predictable, maybe unavoidable. And in fact, it might result in a transformation in the, the, in, in, in the production of oil and, and the transport of oil. Um, but again, there's so many factors right now that it's really difficult to see through the haze. So I don't wanna make any predictions, but it is what, something that I'm following extremely closely because it's, to me, it's really interesting that so much of it pivots on the ability to have these floating storages so, and on the ability of mastering, mustering these uh, tankers to become a kind of a place to hold the oil because we don't know what's gonna happen with, with the oil prices and with the oil production and all of that. So, um, so, so some of it is absolute mobilization, aware, uh, organized, deliberate, and some of it is gonna be unintended consequences of the kind of conjuncture we are in. I think we'll have two more questions, uh, Lally. One from uh, chat. Uh, I like the way it's phrased. Uh, it says, could you talk about the fiancé structures of mega ships? I think that's finance. But if you want to talk about the fiancé structures of mega ships, we'd be happy to hear that too. How they are both physical and speculative infrastructures. Um, so, um there was a time uh, in mid 20th century where financing very large cargo ships was dependent on being able to show charters. Um, so being able to show that the ship had a series of contracts and so it could pay its way. And so it was dependent, it was charter backed financing. Um, and so it was a much more concrete form of financing for, um, for, for shipping. Uh, um, by concrete, I mean grounded in the kind of material uh, production of uh, 
labor and cargo and 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 uh, etc and so that um so so you could you could get a loan on the basis of these charters on proving that you were going to be working but sometime where in the 1970s with financialization um and and also with the sudden um emergence of the petroleum producers um uh, nationalization of the oil in the petroleum producing countries and this kind of a rush of petrodollars into investments um in in a lot of different uh industries particularly in the global north, what we saw was a switch to a kind of a more financialized form of, uh, of financing for shipping and much more speculative for that reason. So essentially they become much, much closer to a mortgage. So the ship itself became a kind of a collateral for the loan that they were getting. And that meant that it, in many instances, if you uh, applied for a loan to finance the building of a ship, uh, right before a fall in global trade, what you ended up having was a ship that wasn't working and therefore uh, it was essentially unable to pay back uh, the, the mortgage. And so what you saw was that the cycles by which ships were produced and scrapped actually sped up. So the effect of that speculative form of finance that emerges in the 1970s with financialization is that there is also destructive, the, the sort of the cycles of uh, producing and des destroying ships speeds up because ships are scrapped because there's no longer need for them. Um, and we see that now. Well, now, one of the other things that, that one of the other effects of that process has been that a lot of the companies that are um, that, that are, for example, shipping companies, the biggest ones, Maersk or uh, or the biggest oil producers like a British Petroleum or Exxon, actually don't no longer own their own ships, uh, and so they charter their own ships, and so they depend on more specialized owners. The Norwegians and Greeks have the tankers, the container ships are owned by various consortia around the world. And so I think that the, what you also find is that that's a kind of a specialization of ownership in particular places. And then that makes them, because these places are in different parts of the world and some specialize here and some specialize there, um, as you see, for, for example, at this moment when trade barriers are coming up, you see that there might be problems, there might be associated problems with, for example, those processes of chartering, um, et cetera. And so, again, this is one of those interesting things. There's a, um, there's a wonderful article that very clearly, I write about it a little bit in my, uh, in my uh, book, and I'm hoping to talk about it in, a, in an article I'm writing about tankers, but there's a wonderful article by a woman, uh, Elizabeth Sibilia, who actually talks about this financing process uh, in great depth, and I would I would recommend that. Just look up Elizabeth Sibilia. So that's a, that's a very good article. She's got fantastic history of the financing process. Right. I mean, uh, it, it, it's a pity we don't have infinite time because there are so many particular details of of uh, things that I just learned. I finally learned what the Baltic dry index was or Lascars, where you read about Lascars and Sherlock Holmes uh, stories, but you don't know what they are. I won't answer those or I'd say read the book and, and look at this, uh, uh, you know, or, or uh, bulk break cargo or stuff like that. All of the, uh, it's all there in this wonderful collection of, of particulars. I want to leave you with a kind of speculative thought experiment as a kind of a last question, which um, goes back to our notion of uh, 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 imperialism still being American driven and so forth and capital. Uh, uh, every time there has been a socialist or communist revolution in the world or something like Allende, uh, it can look forward to un implacable uh, American hostility and tr tremendous pressure. Uh, at a certain point, it, uh, some people have thought well, the one place where you wouldn't face that is in America itself, in the uh, la cabeza de la hidra, the, the head of the hydra. Let's imagine that there is a communist revolution or a socialist revolution in America uh, that essentially takes down its co uh, connections to capital. Uh, could one imagine that being left alone or could one see an alliance between China, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Russia coming in to rescue democracy in America from communism. Is that an utter science fictional fantasy or in the world that we're heading towards, 
will there be a kind of guarantors of capitalism who will save it from an American revolution? Um, having lived through probably one of the most important revolutions of the 20th century because of the way that it shaped the world and shaped, shaped various forms of mobilization subsequently, I would have to say that um, there's a famous book called The Unthinkable Revolution in Iran. And I think that revolutions are unthinkable until they become thinkable. And so I think I, as, as have, having lived through the euphoria and then of course the subsequent devastation of a revolutionary movement, uh, I, I never say never. Um, and the kind of speculative thing that you're talking about, I mean, I think that if a revolution happens in the US, it will happen in ways that we don't anticipate because I think that the US continues to confound me despite the fact that I've, I've been fascinated by it from, the, from, well, being the daughter of communists from when I was very little. Um, but uh, so I would say never, say never. And I would be very interested to see who comes to, to put down the revolution. And I think those kinds of culprits that you mentioned are very possible ones, of course, because um, yeah, they, they all have an investment in the kind of a system in which we are still living in, despite, despite the kinds of enmities, play enmities everybody's engaged in, they are all invested in this system. You're absolutely right. This is, this is a capitalist system from which the Russia's oligarchs and the Chinese uh, capitalists and the Israeli capitalists and technology producers are all benefiting. So, a revolution might happen. Hopefully it will happen. Uh, thanks very much, Lali. Uh, there's a, there are a million things left to talk about. I, I do want to really recommend that people go out and buy this book and read it. I think it's an utter delight to read. I know uh, you quote Mike Davis in the beginning, who when he was writing City of Courts, yeah. said, I keep wondering who's going to be interested in all these details. But of course, it is these details uh, kind of put together in the kind of relational complex that uh, Lally does in the book that, that, that make it fascinating. And uh, I, I can't recommend this too highly and, and tell you uh, how nice it is to at last have talked to you in person. Uh, it's one of the signs that uh, for all the surveillance aspects of the uh, uh, Facebook and internet and so forth, it does function in a minimalist way as a republic of letters because it was only by reading Lala's sentences in her contributions on, uh, uh, on Facebook that I was directed to her work. And from then, the rest is history or whatever. So thanks very much. Thank you very much for having me. And I'm very grateful about this. And I look forward to seeing you again on the 23rd of May. Oh, yes. And, and let's be sure to mention uh, that on May 23rd, at noon. Uh, we have a panel called uh, Bottlenecks, Choke Points, and Supply Chains uh, with uh, Lale, with Charmaine Shua, with Deb Cowan, with Sandra Mizedra, the author of The Politics of Operations, Logistics, Extractivism, and Finance, uh, maybe in another order of the three elements. Uh, uh, Spencer Cox, who organizes uh, people at Amazon, and uh, uh, I think someone else I'm forgetting, in, in, but uh, uh, sort of a mega logistics panel, because you know, we are facing the question of what are we going to be missing in about a year because of what's happened. And uh, uh, so I'm looking forward immensely to that discussion. So that's uh, May 23rd. Uh, on at noon. If you like what Red May is doing in terms of bringing these discussions uh, into our kind of public sphere, uh, please think about supporting us. Uh, click on uh, donate in our website, redmayseattle.org. Uh, the way we usually support ourselves every year uh, is we put all of the festival on a credit card at the beginning of the month. And then during all our live events, I get out uh, and uh, give an announcement saying we've got to pay off this credit card. It usually works live. This year, we don't have any live events. And we have a lot of plane fares that unfortunately, uh, even though the air airlines are being bailed out, they are not going to want to surrender any of the money to us, even though they're canceling the flights. 
for these live events. So I don't hold great store on our ability to recover it. Uh, so we depend on you, a radical viewer everywhere in the world. Uh, please go to our website and donate and come to the rest of our events and, and uh, send in questions over chat. So thank you very much. I think, uh, how do we end this? Can, can we declare it specifically over uh, producers and backstage? Uh, am, am I off? Yes, yes. Lovely. Off the air? Okay. Fantastic. Thanks a lot. Well, I hope it, uh, what are, are, 